Welcome to another episode of Insights with Experts, where we aim to foster discussion, learning, and creating an informed global community. To view this and other interviews in detail, head over to insightswithexperts.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Insights with Experts. Joining me and my co-host, Noah Tracy, today, we have Mr. Thomas Walsh. Now, Thomas is the current founder of the investment firm, Samandu. He's had a long history in and out of the startup world as a mentor, as an investor, and so on. And while beforehand, he actually found himself as an associate partner, the global management consulting firm, McKinsey. And I'd also just like to point out to everyone that Thomas is also a fellow Melbourne University alumni. So that's always nice to have as well. Thomas, um, amazing to have you here today. How are you? How are things over in Switzerland on the other end of the world? Uh, they're fantastic. So thanks for having me on, guys. We're looking forward to the chat. Um, appreciate the intro. Uh, my life certainly didn't feel as uh, concise and well-structured as the way you presented it, living it. So uh, maybe you can tell me what the next 50 years will be as well. <laughs> <laughs> too easy, too easy. Um, yeah, so did you just want to give us a quick background, you know, how you grew up, where you came from? you know, your sense of direction in life and uh, sort of what brought you to where you are today? Yeah, no problem. So um, I'm Australian by birth, half British by um, inheritance on my father's side. So I grew up very much in the, uh, in Australian educational environment, um, but with sort of half of, not even a leg, but maybe a foot in, uh, in Europe uh, due to the sort of the extended family. And the reason I mention that is I now live in Europe and it's been um, somewhat of a, a nice uh, contrast looking at how lucky I was, I think, growing up in an Australian environment, um, while at the same time feeling like it's not too foreign being over here now. But to give you a bit of a background where I grew up, how I grew up um, and where I ended up, I um, uh, grew up just in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and went through sort of public schooling and then private schooling uh, and then ended up at Melbourne University doing a Bachelor of Arts, basically because I knew I'd, my uh, brother and sister are doctors, so I knew I didn't want to be a doctor. Uh, and a bunch of family friends are lawyers, and I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. And um, so art seemed like a good choice. Um, now, no offence to Melbourne Uni, I don't think they did a very good job of selling themselves on a Bachelor of Arts because no one seemed to think it was a wise choice. <laughs> and uh, I will say it was not uh, people thought I was going to, you know, like either I was doing arts and crafts or um, I was, you know, going to um, spend all day every day in the library um, reading books and journals so I um, loved uh, loved my time at Melbourne Uni but I would say my time at Melbourne Uni was more focused on um, an apprenticeship in uh, doing things on the side while still trying to get a degree and pros and cons of that I feel like the con of it is I feel like I didn't take as much out of the university as I could have um, at the same time, I felt like I got a lot more learning and a lot more energy from, from working. So I did a bunch of different jobs, um, playing my way through uni from, uh, you know, working at hospitality events, very common, um, getting fired from those uh, companies because I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, best job of my life still to this day was working for Vertigo High Access, which is a uh, high ropes access. So I was working on, um, you know, the 101 Collins and, so forth of the two, three hundred meter high buildings, putting in um, lighting arrangements, and at National Australia Bank went to NAB when I was working at yeah. uh, with Vertigo, and we put six hundred and ninety bits of neon uh, in the NAB sign. Um, so th those were sort of like the little bit around, you know, growing up in school. Love, you know, Australian upbringing. You, I think it's very hard not to love sport, whatever the version is that you uh, you enjoy. So played a lot of sport. Um, was in, involved in a lot of different extracurricular activities, if you like, but really had a passion also for education. I like I was so lucky to be born in a period, you know, I think in Australia's um, greatest growth and prosperity, if you like, and my parents could send me to a great education system. Uh, and I saw how much uh, I took out of that, with, which was not of my own creation, if you like. Somebody had you know, created that and given it to me. And if I'd been born in a different country, in a different circumstance would be very different. So education formed as something that was very sort of clear to me. And then, uh, and I'm sure we'll get there, we'll talk a bit more about sort of the entrepreneur, the disruptor um, type of character as well that I was exposed to in, in those early years that really shaped my um, future direction. 
Yeah, I'd just uh, like, like to ask as well. So, you know, you talk about the fact that that job at Vertigo was the job you enjoyed the most. Why do you, why do you, well, why do you leave? Why did you stop? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so a little bit more context because I, I'm not sure your audience is most, mostly people at university, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 All right. So uh, my experience at university is always like, it's very, it's economics 101. And it's like, what do I want to do? And do I have any money in the bank account to be able to do that? Yeah. And if I don't, then I got to go put some in, top it up, top up the tank, and I can go do stuff. And so Vertigo was this wonderful job. I loved rock climbing. So as a kid and at school, I'd always done rock climbing and found uh, different ways to, you know, go into big trips. But um, at university, I didn't make money. And someone told me about this group called Vertigo, who uh, actually, you know, was full of ex rock climbers who just did this during the week and then went, went climbing on the weekend. And so I went down there and um, put the, you have to get this certification, I'll speak all the details of that, but basically put it on my credit card, bill I couldn't pay. And it was this uh, week long accreditation, a couple of grand. And I was like, geez, this better pay off. And um, fortunately, it did. They gave me a job at the end of it. But the thing around why did, why did I enjoy it so much was, I mean, firstly, I was getting back in, this was 20, what was it, 20 uh, odd years ago, I was getting paid 60 bucks an hour. Um, standard rate and I worked most weekends where you get double or time and a half and uh, all I get to do is climb all day be outside in the sun climbing off big buildings you know hanging out with guys that I really enjoyed um, so compared to like sitting in a room in a lecture listening to you know some topic on philosophy it was pretty hard to uh, to say no to um, but the crux of it is I didn't see myself uh, being stimulated in that job for a long time so to your question of why did I not stay there, it was amazing and it was great fun, but it was, you know, clearly I'd look at it and I'd say, like, I'm not the... No one stayed in that job that I could... I looked at the people in that work and none of them were there because they loved that job. They loved it because it allowed them to do what they wanted to do on the side. And, yeah. and that became a bit of a theme for me around where I, and where I still am today is how do you, how do you shift yourself from working uh, on one hand to, on the other hand, do the things you really like? Uh, and have sort of this bi forced bifurcation where you do a job that pays you, but then separately you go and do the things that you enjoy. And that's become a lifelong challenge. So how do I bridge those two and actually do the things I enjoy and somehow the bills get paid? So yeah, well, we can we can unpick that later if you'd like, but that's a bit the thing. Yeah, that's it. Uh, now, it sounds like you had, yeah, your growing up was pretty good in the way you, you, you sort of took what you enjoyed when you were younger and brought it into younger years, if you know what I mean, when you first go into that job industry sort of world. Um, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's good. I wanted to, like, follow up on that point you made there about the fact that there's there's, there's always that, like, trade-off between the work you're doing but what you, you actually enjoy. Did you end up finding a job that, I guess, solved those two things? where you were in that job, you enjoyed it so much, it was your passion, but it also acted as a job, it also acted as a piece of work. Yeah, let me answer that in two parts. Um, the simple answer is yes, I did find, there was a moment where I found a job that and my life was so well overlapped that I was living, breathing, doing um, exactly what I loved. And that was Anke, that was the, the social business and education uh, co-founded in South Africa. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second because the the, sec the point I wanted to make actually is like it's a journey. And I think it's very hard to say I've got to a destination. Um, and that destination is where I want to be. I think almost every time I've had an aspiration for something, be it um, as basic as, you know, as an object, as like, you know, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a nice cricket bat, maybe it was, you know, a job title, whatever it might be. As soon as I've got there, all, all of the lust that I had for that object, position, association, whatever it might have been, actually, on, upon reaching that point, it's a bit like climbing a mountain. When you, you see a peak, you're like, I'm going to get to that peak. It's going to be amazing. And nine times out of ten, you get to that peak. And now, at that elevation, you can see the next. Or you can see another. And you're like, well, actually, I don't want to stay here. Like, staying here is boring now. Before, yeah. it was all I could see. But now, I can see all these other ones. I'm like, well, we better keep moving. And I, I think that's, if I put it succinctly, uh, I think life is a search for perspective. And that search of 
perspective is what drives me is that as you as you get it you realize it's not a destination you realize it's just like an uh, an added uh, perspective that allows you to see something differently and within that contrast matters what do i mean by contrast i mean like it's the you know would you enjoy a hot day a beach sunny summer's day as much if you'd never had cold wet miserable days Yeah. Mm. Would you enjoy a holiday as much if you'd never actually, you know, worked or did something you didn't enjoy? Mm. Would you enjoy competition, uh, competing, if there was no competition, right? And so, like playing sport, some people say it's all about winning, and there's a whole, you know, like a lot of theory and a lot of science and a lot of experts around that. But for me, actually, the 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 joy or the actual act of winning is not the result; it's the ability to compete. And to experience, um, and so coming back to your point, like have I ever found those? I've found at different times where there's a nice synergy and overlap of my inner self and my inner purpose and values with the physical physical activities I undertake. Um, but they've never been a. I've never felt like I've got to the destination. I feel like I've just then got added perspective uh, of what I want to go keep doing and go do more of or do less of. <laughs> I know. So I've I've just got a question on going from like from what you said there. You've gone from this environment. You've been outdoors. You worked an outdoor job, then gone to a corporate job where you're inside all day, and sort of a big shift and a big shift in what in what you've done in your career path as like a set out of what you're actually doing. Um, when it comes to like you're talking there, you're talking about mountains, peaks. Another big, very interesting topic I'd I'd like to touch on, and I'm sure Sean would as well. Um, We've done your research on you, obviously, and 25 different countries, and you visited over 60. When you talk about like reaching that next peak and traveling around, is is there a lot that you got from that experience? You know, of going around to these different places and seeing and opening yourself up culturally to so much more out there. Yeah, look, it's um, it's very much on theme with what I was discussing before around like it's a I find life a journey. I had a by way of a story into into it, I had a school teacher when I was in uh, grade eight who taught us English and personal development, which at that time personal development was a bit ahead of the curve. Like everyone's like, you know, that's all an hour you get free in a week, and you know, like it's just a waste of time. Um, it's a separate topic if you want to get there. Like my views on education and what we're not teaching, but we should be. We can uh, we can talk about that's probably one of them. But the um, the quick thing I would say around this is he introduced me to a poem by T.S. Eliot and the poem uh, is called Little Gidding. And there's a passage in that poem which goes that we shall n- not cease from exploration. At the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know it for the first time. And ever since I was a little kid, that's really stuck with me in terms of everything I do is like, it's just an exploration. Now, the cool thing about traveling countries is like it's a very manifest way of experiencing that. You know, I can get on a plane, I'll land at different places, completely different physical, um, sensual overload, the smell, the language, the noise, the music, the um, appearance, the representation of people. Like So it, for me, that's a very, very practical way of um, enjoying that exploration. But you can also get it from books. You can get it from podcasts. You can get it from the internet. So, like, the theme for me has been, like, I'm a, I'm a pretty simple guy um, in the sense that I love just being immersed. I love being overwhelmed. I love going and seeing. And I feel like every time I go to a place, and particularly go to a, a different country, I'm more struck by how much is common and shared than is how much is different. So... Yeah, right. yeah, okay, different clothes, different like cultural associations, different language, but like if you framed it as, um, you know, is there more that holds us together as a human species or <laughs> than separates us? I would like wholeheartedly say, you, you know, objectively, scientifically, we are all much closer than we think we're different. Sadly, at different points in time, particularly in different um, uh, contexts, uh, not least political ones, we like to emphasise the differences. But I think that's very, very, very um, uh, false because if you just took people as they were without putting any sort of 
previous conceptions or perceptions on, you just enjoy it. Like that's the thing I found particularly when I first went and lived and worked in Africa. Yeah. I was just blown away by how I, how many um, defense mechanisms this uh, white kid from Australia had built up because of what the social st stereotypes and stigmas were at the schooling and the education I was at, which was, you know, white guys don't dance. Uh, you don't stick your head out if you don't want to stand out. You definitely don't sing by yourself. Like if you're a guy, you don't like wear colorful clothing. Like, you know, all these things, but like that were just like these associations that I had sort of grown up and adopted, but didn't represent me, didn't represent the like inner part of me. So when I went to a culture that had a very different flavor to that, which is like everyone moves, everyone dances, everyone sings and is so comfortable and liberated, I was like, wow, like, you know, it feels like somebody just took the blinkers off. And so, it's it's a uh, uh, to your point of like the travel and why so many countries. It's because it's a, again it's something that's like I'm thirsty for it. It's a drink and I, I look to quench my thirst by seeing that. Um, but as a theme, I think it applies agnostic of if you're physically visiting countries or seeing countries. Yeah, I mean, I think you only you only actually realize how naive you are to what the world has to offer until you go out there, until you travel, until you see all these things. With that, like, was there any specific country that you went to that just changed your perspective on the world? That, you know, you just left that country thinking, wow. Is there any specific place out there? Uh, almost almost every one. You're not going to like that as an answer. Because I don't, there's, there's very, like, I've never been uh, disappointed. Um, that said, to give you, like, a, not just a wishy washy everyone answer, I'll give you two examples. The first was, uh, when I went and lived and worked in South Africa, the first reason I went there was to um, help run a project that was focused on HIV um, uh, prevention in teenage uh, women in a place called the Valley of a Thousand Hills uh, in KwaZulu Natal. Now, there's a little bit of context there. Um, the HIV infection rate between of uh, 16 to 25 year old uh, women was about 76%. Wow, 76. Oh, 76%. Now, that's not because they can't get the antiretrovirals, the drugs, and it's not because they can't get condoms. Both of those things are there. The reason that they had such a high infection rate was very much the culture. And it was there in Zulu culture, in those townships, there was very low, you know, very low basis of education, if any. Secondly, the cultural norms that have been adopted uh, certainly recently, this is not true of the, you know, the history of the culture, but certainly of the last um, 30, 50 years have been that it's all right for men to have multiple partners, but it's very shameful for a woman to. And so what would happen is that, you know, a guy would sleep with multiple women and if he gets infected, they would get it, um, but they wouldn't want to talk about it. And so, like, there's this whole sort of perpetuating thing around, well, how do you not just go in and say, here's a solution, condoms or antiretrovirals? How do you go in and empathise with the situation and say, well, I don't know the answer because I can't tell you my solution. I need to figure out yours. Um, and how in the situation that, is a, again, as a, a white Australian guy coming in just being like, oh, you know, like, clearly we can solve this. The thing that really uncovered and to come to your point, like what left a mark for me was like going in and realizing like my view of what is terrible, uh, was in part true. Like these were facts, but at the same time, these were people who were far more genuine and connected with who they were as individuals than I was with all of my education, all my upbringing. Like I was continually inspired and amazed by like how they would invite me and how they wouldn't, they'd listen to me. They wouldn't like immediately judge this person valuable to me or not. Would they, they wouldn't feel like, you know, they had to allocate time or reprioritize. And I just compared that to myself, which was like my life had always been sort of brought up of like there must be more and more and more things going on. And as you do that, you'll spend, you'll focus on where to spend time and where not to spend time. You wouldn't like if you walk down the street in Melbourne and somebody said like, oh, hey, can I ask you a question? I think on average, people would just be like frustrated that they're being stopped. Or like I've got to get somewhere. I've got to do something. Yeah. And it was the inverse was true for me in, in South Africa, which was it just made me realise like actually there's a genuineness to people that um, some part of what I've experienced made me a bit more um, uh, a bit more muted or dull to. 
And so that, and then like once you allow yourself to strip that layer away and then like live, start to empathize and live part of their experience just from the singing, the dancing. Like, again, like I said, like you cannot imagine the like fear in me of like getting up and just like <laughs> having a having a go. Um, and I just realized that like, none of that was um, inherent. That was taught to me. And so it was like through that experience, I just very viscerally saw that, you know, I came in with one set of expectation and actually I, I coming in to help and actually they helped me probably more than I did in return to see myself. Um, so that was one and I promised you a second one, which was I lived in West Africa and Guinea for about a year as well. And Guinea is a country where, oh, it's just unfortunate. It's a very, very sad history and it's kind of a list littered with the could have been or should have been or would have been um, in the, it was the first uh, Francophone colony that got rid of the French and the French were very unhappy with that. And there's a whole ugly history of that back in the 50s, 60s. But basically, on paper, you look at this country, it's got the uh, richest iron ore deposits that are untapped. It's got, like, the largest bauxite deposits in the world. It's got the fourth largest uranium. It's got port access. It's also got some gold and uh, some other stuff. And you would look at that in the 60s and say, wow, this country is going to, like, kill it. It's going to be amazing. Um, but it doesn't. And there's a whole complex political situation why it hasn't and why it still remains bottom quartile of almost any metric in Africa. But again, even in that circumstance where I go in with a certain preconceived notion of like, look at these objective facts, which are true, like those are facts, but they don't at all reflect the lived experience of different uh, parts of that population. So again, going in and just being exposed again to a culture that's much more expressive, much more open, very warm. They really like, they're just two places where I lived in Africa and it really, really kept uh, a hold on me today in terms of how do I like just remember that I um, I still, I, like, I'm not whole, whole, if that makes sense. Not that I have, you know, get, it's more like I'm, I'm growing like you, like you're a fruit or a flower, or whatever the analogy you want to use is. If the act is to grow, like, where do you source nutrients and where do you source um, inspiration? And that, for me, really comes from things that are much more foreign to my own knowledge because they really spark a, a different direction in my own growth. Yeah, yeah. So, like, obviously, uh, you're talking about the educational system. You were going to make mention to it before. You said, look, I'll bring it up later. I'm actually quite curious now after, after hearing that. Um, if you were to make two or three comments about the educational system here and how you see it after going, obviously, overseas and seeing the countries and seeing the lack of education there, but how, what's the word, what's the way to put it? Um, how together everyone is and how in tune everyone is with each other. Um, what could you say that we or you'd like to see a change or shift in in our educational system here to sort of bring, because obviously we've got a big corporate world here and you're in the corporate world or have been, um, and how you can see that shifting the dynamic in which the business world sort of works and how people grow up and evolve? Yeah, yeah big question. Um, yeah. Let me pause for a moment to try and be succinct. I'm sorry, um, sorry, I'm 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 sorry, i am sorry i Two or three things after going and shifting your, your life to a whole new perspective, like seeing a whole new world out there. Mm. There's three things you want to say, hey, look, what, not even three, whatever you want to say, that you go, look, if there is a change that needs to be changed to sort of bring happiness. You know, I, I see a lot of corporate people, you, you'll see them around, you probably know it yourself. They do the job because you've got to do it. You've got to do it to go home the next day instead of doing it because they love it. They have the passion for it. They have the passion for working with the people there. Mm. A lot of them do the same thing you'll see them you're out there, they're slashed over, doing the same thing every day. You, you don't have that unity. Like, I know some places are very good at, you know, everyone goes out for work drinks and finding things to bring people together and then you find other places don't. And I think that could be changed from a perspective of how the education's run and how, how it could be shifted, you know what I mean? Yeah. So let me, let me put it into three parts. Yeah. Um, let me start with the tangible and then go end up in the macro. So I'll do one very practical piece around 
a shift in education that I see particularly in Western education. Second, I'll talk about like what should drive a vision of education. And third, I'll talk about sort of my view of the macro the world scenario. Um, the first is like I say this shift is already the tactical is this is already underway, which is we no longer live in a world where you have a career for life um, or the technical jobs or technical thinking is the primary driver of the workforce. What do I mean by that is, you know, you only have to go back one or two generations where it was very, if you could get an education, whether it be in more a trade or a science or whatever it might be, you would then look to get employment and in general employment would be in an ideal world, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe you change one or two employers, but you're not, no one's stacking up 10 jobs. Yeah. Right. Um, and they're definitely not stacking up 10 employers. <laughs> That's completely different to where we are today and certainly where we'll be in the next 20, 30 years when you guys are uh, at the height of the workforce. And so that shift is very much meant that like the structure of our education system is completely archaic. I genuinely, other than medicine and even in medicine, it's a bit of a uh, horrible, there's no, there's no structure where like a commerce degree is like the foundation of having a finance job that an arts degree is the foundation of having a There are elements of those that are still very um, helpful. I'm not trying to say they throw it all out, but like it's much more around the type of thinking. You know, if you take McKinsey and Company, McKinsey and Company, they hired thinkers. So what did they look for? And they're like, oh, actually, we like lawyers because lawyers get taught critical thinking. We like doctors because doctors are very um, uh, scientific, very rigorous, uh, results driven. Mm -hmm. We like um, art degrees because, like, yeah, they have more of a like a creative uh, conception. We like, well, actually, they didn't really like BCOMs that much. Um, they were too much sort of finance and should go to banking. But <laughs> the point is, they weren't looking for the degree. They were looking for a style of thinking. And what is the skill that underpins that style of thinking? And I think that we could go down and spend a lot of time there, but I won't. But I'd say, like, the first implication is like education is not fit for purpose today. Yeah. It is focused on a traditional structure of industries, jobs, um, professions. And I think almost every profession in the future will be focused on capability, a type of um, thinking, a type of role, a type of um, problem solving and empathy to solve problems collectively and empathy to work online and in person. Um, and these are not things you can't teach. You can teach them very well. But like, does anyone teach you in school how to empathize with the problem? Does anyone teach you in school how to work remotely in a way that is engaging and motivating? Does anyone teach you how to like build uh, a team of multicultural um, people that you may never meet? Um, and does anyone tell you how to deal with personal problems that your team experiences? And does anyone, you know, so well, there's a long list, but I'd just say that first bucket of like, it's not fit for purpose today and we should shift. That doesn't mean we throw everything out. Um, but I think we need to translate it much more as to a capability lens than a technical skill lens. Yeah. Just just on that on that first point. So I couldn't agree with that entire concept more. Like I'd rather see someone in the field rolling up their sleeves, actually getting stuck in learning firsthand than, you know, listening to what some guy's saying in a lecture hall and so on. Now we've talked about that, right? But Let's assume tomorrow I approached McKinsey. I didn't have a degree, but what I did have, I said, McKinsey, trust me, uh, I'm a good empathizer. I've volunteered here. I've worked here. I've worked in this country here. Would I get turned away? Would they not have that one very simple metric? That's does this guy have a so-and-so certificate from this place? In the sense that there's still that, that massive, you know, thing there. I like, like I said, the it's not just the education system, it's also the employees, which is employers and their recruiting system needs to change. The two things need to change. But at the same time, they're already changing. So I won't, you know, I won't yeah. speak for McKinsey, but they did as much as possible try and get away from just the tick box criteria. Mm -hmm. And they did try to focus more on um, skills, demonstration of skills in whichever way they can be shown. Right. Um, so I... I two quick pieces of that puzzle. One part piece is, you know, everyone knows Elon Musk. Um, some people may know the Ad Astra, the school he set up um, as a sort of side project for his kids and kids at um, yeah. Tesla. Yeah. That's now spun off into something called um, Synthesis and it's now open and it's like trying to use, their whole theory is very much in this sort of theme, which is 
um, game-based learning? How do you use technology and stimulating environments like yeah. experimenting yeah. and doing, solving together, rather than like just you know teaching, uh, like it's in lectures or whatever? And the the point I would say is the following: neither one is right or wrong. It's more around a fit for purpose nature, and so there is a time and a place for the technical knowledge. Like I would say, there are two types of problems. There is a practice-based problems, and there are knowledge-based problems. Practice-based problems are like, okay, how do you design uh, a new car? How do you like um, build uh, a new product? How do you, you know, whether that's a digital product, a phone, or a physical product, da da da. Those things you practice, you have to keep doing, get feedback, experiment. A knowledge-based problem might be something that is more like um, uh, if we're creating a nuclear weapon, um, what is the science behind that? We probably don't want to experiment until we really, really understand the knowledge of that because it's a big downside. And so there's two sort of quotes I would use to emphasize those. One is Einstein's, uh, which is like, if I had an hour to stop the end of the world, I'd spend 55 minutes understanding it and five minutes acting. All right, and that's the point. A knowledge-based problem, you should understand it because the consequence is so high. Mm. But a practice-based problem, you know, I'll use an art analogy. Mm. An art teacher took his uh, students, divided them down the line, and he said, "Okay, one half, you're, I'm going to measure your performance on output, just the sheer volume of, and this is like um, clay sculpture. Uh, I'm going to measure you on output." you will be solely judged on how many you know, new pots and clay creations you can make. This half, you're going to be judged on quality. You need to make the best single piece of uh, clay artwork, you know, pottery that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Who do you think came out with the better design, the better pottery? Hope you're enjoying the episode so far. To learn more about Orakui, as well as more information about our upcoming episodes, don't forget to follow our socials for constant updates and education content. Links are always in the description. Or you'd, you'd think you'd, you'd think that the one that's trying to make the best quality one, yeah, you know, quality over quantity. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. You you may think but, that. But I, think think the working, I do think in the working world and the world the way it works these days, that is going to push you out. You know, look for workers rather than people at the top. That is going to push you out for as much as you can get. Well, the quantity guys had better better pottery, right. and the reason being is because that was a skill that was practice based the art of actually doing it very quickly, very continuously meant the learning curve was far steeper yeah. Yeah. than if you just tried to make the perfect piece. Yeah. And so this is why I'd say it's important. You, neither one is right or wrong. Which one is fit for purpose at the time? And so that's the point around the education system. We've been focused much more on one type, which is like you should learn and understand everything and then do. And I, I think that's shifted is you should yeah. now start to do as much as possible. And like learning code, you could go to lectures for two years and never write one bit of code. You could go and just start from day one trying to write Python or something, right, and have a learn by doing. And that's, that's the point I think that's, that's fundamentally uh, changing that. Yeah. I just got something like a point to make on that is like a lot of business people I speak to in particular, they always talk about practical versus theoretical. So everything you learn at uni, they find that a lot of people that come from uni, like, yes, there is some stuff people need to know coming from uni. That's 100% right. Say you're an accountant or you're, you're doing law, you need to learn stuff. But you never, when it comes to running a business, the practical side of things, people don't get taught. So, like, people get a business degree and you find a lot of people don't actually, like, they pretty much could throw it out the window mm. as soon as they get into the business world because unless you've actually been in there, you, you won't understand what you're doing. It's, it's the way you think has got to be a bit different as well as having that. Is that what you, you were sort of trying to hit on there? You're trying to say the practical side needs to be explained and people need to develop that it, side before they start something and come out of that uni sort of... It, it's a lot of overlap um, in what I'm saying. I think it's a, it's a very good point that there's a difference between the theory and the practice. I, I would slightly separate what I was saying, though, from that for me, I focus on problems and structure a problem, like what is the activity, what is the task, and therefore what type of learning or what type of um, mm. yeah. application of knowledge or practice is appropriate. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes theory is exactly what you need. Yeah. Um, if you're like in a manufacturing environment and you're producing paper um, and you're producing uh, a thousand tons a day, um, somebody tweaking the, 
uh, coagulation unit by yeah. a point zero zero one micron or whatever it will have a very dramatic practical outcome. So you don't want someone to just come in and practice. You want someone to understand, know the theory, yeah. therefore mm. they can like apply it properly. Yeah. At the same time, if you're doing something like coding, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing pure theory. You want to have the basic set of structures or principles, and then you want to yeah. actually practice. Yeah. So um, the Second bit, though, I didn't know we're going to spend a lot of time on this. So I'll try and be more succinct on this, but I'm passionate about education. Um, yeah. the, the point is, you need, if you want to know where you're going, you have to have, and it's a bit of a theme with me perspective, if you want to design an educational system, you need to have a view of where, where you're trying to get to. Not necessarily, again, the exact destination, but the view of here's the direction that we're going to go into the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 hundred years, like some horizon that is certainly more than an election cycle or certainly more than a one degree cycle, because you cannot put, you cannot marshal the resources, the energy and the focus behind something on short time spans. You can't do anything in education in less than a decade. Like yeah. You can't do a single thing. Um, so I think, you know, time unit, whether it's 20, 30 years or it's 50 years or it's even hundred years, you need to have a, a perspective that is broader than what I personally want or what, you know, a leader or what uh, um, a dean or so much. we need the structure. And that's like when you see society and systems work well is when there is a cohesive tiering of layers. There's those who are executing now. There's those who are looking just beyond that fringe. And there are those who are thinking not at all in the details, but much more, okay, where do we want to end up? What's going to make Melbourne University great? Not now, but in 30 years or in 50 years. Like what is going to be distinctive? And the simple analogy I use on this is: um, the, Do you know anything about the Melbourne sewerage system? Not at all. No, no, I don't, I don't know at all. Yeah, about that. Never, never, never <laughs> did I. But have a look up. I think there's a few good articles in like the Age or something. But this was built Great Depression 1930s, and these things were built out of cobblestone, and they are huge. I mean, like giant, giant tunnels for sewerage and drainage under Melbourne back in the 30s, and they were not built for you know, the capital um, return of the next uh, five years or the next 10 years or the political cycle of the current term uh, or the current government, they were built to build the infrastructure of a city that would last generations. And this is the thing that's amazing is people keep opening them up every uh, five, 10 years for inspection. They're like, I can't believe this thing is still like fit for purpose. It's still like delivering. Now in some places it has them and so forth. But like as a whole, the way they used to build things um, was much more on a long-term basis. And I think there's a balance. Not everything should be built for 100 years, but not everything should be, you know, just extracted for now. And I, I think, you know, if you apply that analogy to education, I think that's really a, a, a conflict I've seen in my time, which is around monetization, a lot of government funding going, so universities focus on how do we get money now, what are the degrees we think we need matter now, how do we put people in? Which is fair. You need to have some people focusing on that, but I, I miss the piece of people looking longer term. And so the, that's sort of point two. And the final point, point three, is I say one of the things that really drives me is this sort of very simple idea of what we are a moment in time. Like Carl Sagan has these like great explanations of the universe and all the planets out there, right? Like we're a, a, a grain of sand on a you know, very long beach. And I think that's true, not just of like us as a planet, but us as a moment in time. Uh, and if you look at it and you say like, okay, well, in 500 years from now, what are they going to be saying about millennials? Like what was the stupidest things that millennials believed or did that people are just going to be like, wow, I can't believe they did that. You know, what's going to be like the crusades or what's going to be like slavery. Or even if you know that in 500 years, last 50 years, you know, um, segregation, um, gender rights, women in the workforce, uh, indigenous population recognized. So, you know, if you so like much. that's in 50 years, those things have happened. So in 100 much. years, you say, like, yeah. But we live now today as though we've got it all right. Yeah. Like, we have a very hard time seeing more than a little bit ahead of us, like one or two yeah, steps. That's very true. Right? <laughs> and you take any of the topics today that are in the public debate, I find they're so focused on holding on to the past. And the easiest way I find to strip the past is not to say we ignore the past, but the only thing that is true is change will continue. And we can either 
try and embrace change and create something that is better than when we left, when we found it, leave something better than when we found it. Or we can hold on and let change happen to us and probably break things in the process. Yeah. And yeah. There you go. I just the, the final point on that is to say, like, I think that's the thing that unlocks you to think about what, if you say, like, what are those things that I cannot see now, but if I took the lens of looking back, you know, 500 years looking back, these people are just going to be like, wow, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe we treated people this way. I can't believe, like, we, I can't believe we, you know, people had children. Maybe, like, we were going to be, you know, it'll all be artificial by then. Who knows? But I feel like that liberates you now from having to solve what's the right because people get stuck on what's the right decision now. And I find that that's, um, it's a bit depressing, to put simply. No, <laughs> um, I, yeah. I think that's spot on. But I was also like, you can relate that to a lot to how the government works as well in this day and age, I think personally. Like, I think like people's terms for prime ministers, like, they think about the now and what can keep them in place rather than looking, well, you know what? What can I do for 10, 20 years down the track? We can hold them on to, you know what I mean? That we, we're going to forever be thankful for. It's like, what can we do now for the next year, two years? So people are, yes, yes, yes. And we get realigned, re, you know, reassigned back to their position rather than, you know, holding someone in place and going, you know, I'm going to trust them. I can trust my gut here. This is what they're going to do. We're going to hold them in here and then look for something to fix us in the next 20, 30, 40 years because the world's changing that fast. So like, there's always something on the news about something big happening. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, well, what can we do to sort of fix that? And that's probably by having like a stable government. That's how I see it too at the moment. That's how I look at it because it's in the education system. It's also in the government. But that's not really me having a dig at the government. I don't really have too much of a dig at them. Yeah. No, we, we can definitely yeah. have a dig, dig at the government. That's what, they, that's what they're there for. But um, yeah. no, look, I... I Clearly, is applicable in, in our lived um, politic experience, and sadly, Australia, I don't think, has been shining uh, example for the world to follow the last couple of decades. Um, so, you know, rather than pulling pulling that apart too much, I think the point I would say is, you know, why do I care so much about education? Well, back to my South Africa experience, I was living in a country that was post apartheid. Um, and had all these dreams and aspirations that a lot of have not been fulfilled. There's more inequality now than there was um, when Mandela first took power. And when you look at that, one of the things I just, it was so stark as a foreigner to come to was you have all these dreams and aspirations of an integrated, um, joyous rainbow nation, but everyone in power you can change the color of the people in power, but the reality is their lived experience was one of segregation. Yeah, yeah. They haven't lived an integrated, you know, how do you foster integration? How do you bring two different, you know, very different um, paths together? How do you deal with that? And admire, I admire a lot of what they've done, but I like, I look at that and I look then at the education system and they're still perpetuating that. 90% of the um, African population will go to very poor schools. They'll be very lucky if they have the school building, let alone a teacher who's been well-educated. And you have very privileged white schools and you have a lot of white people going there and yeah, there's maybe like in a white school, there's one or two percent that's African. And you're like, well, how are you creating a generation of leaders that are going to be, that are knowing what inclusivity and knowing what that rainbow potential is in their formative years, if you're not bringing them up, how can you possibly uh, get to where you aspire to be? And I think that's back to the point of, you know, whether it's politics or whatever. Politics is just a reflection of the country and of the circumstance. And you can get people who are more or less driven by ethics and values, which I would hope is there. But, you know, the little flip side where you get a lot of attention of people like that. But if you're not educating people, if you're not giving people the chance when they're in the formulative years to understand what doing a better job than what we inherited looks like, I think we're, that's where we're failing. We're not failing at the time when the politician's already there, it's been there for 20 years, and we're expecting them to make a better decision. Like, no, that's not fair to that person. Like, that person is what they are. Maybe we can expect them to shift a little bit if there's enough you know, noise, but actually our job should be focused more on, like, how do we improve the pipeline? Um, yeah, very, very true. Mm-hmm. Very yeah, true. Absolutely. On that point, seriously, we're, we're, we're talking so much about making change. And I mean, I'm sure you like wouldn't be, I mean, if you look at the TV, look outside, you'll see a very big population of people. Actually, Gen Z at the moment, actually, as a proportion of human history, Gen Z currently have the largest 
population in human history as a proportion of everyone at the moment. So we've, we've got this massive group, group of people, and I think Gen Z are very, very passionate about social issues, particularly climate change, all these things. Now, we're talking about all these social issues. We're talking about making change. We're talking about a population that wants to enact these changes. The question is how? The question is, you know, we're a group of students, we're a group of people who are fairly young. We don't have much economic power. How do we then enact change as a force? And, you know, if you ask someone like Jordan Peterson this question, he would often say that quote. He would say, uh, before you clean the world, clean your room. Essentially saying to young, young people, don't go looking to change the world. Take care of yourself first. What do you say to that? How do you think young people can actually make a change? Uh, I won't comment on Peterson. We'll leave him out of it. We'll leave him out of it. Um, the, there's a lot you can say about um, what is structural and will just happen, will be inherited. Like if you look at population, demographic shifts and so forth, like you you know, the US is an easy example. If you looked at what's happened in terms of representation uh, in between the two parties, the Democratic and the Republican, um, and nominally like a system of where the majority wins a vote, but actually it's, a you know, with the structure they have um, with the Electoral College, it's not representative on population, it's representative on other biases and so forth. And again, you can have a whole thing on what's right or wrong, but the point is, What's happened is there has been such a demographic shift and an increase in population and representation in a, Demo in a Democratic Party, it's effectively forced the Republican Party to get even more focused on small niches and do gerrymandering like redraw boxes, but actually their representation doesn't at all reflect the, um, the country. Yeah. The country's population, if you look at the number of um, Hispanic or African-American senators or elected representatives of the Republican Party, versus the Democratic Party is just, aside from ideas, the two are not reflective of the same country. Like, not at all. Yeah. Um, and you have to a degree, you have that to a lesser extent in Australia between the Labour and Liberal where they're not reflective of the same country. Um, and so they end up reflecting pieces of the country. And so when you say, like, what makes change happen? Well, I think there's the two pieces. One is, like, there are structural shifts that will happen and either you, you can find forcing mechanisms to drive greater integration and tackle things even if you're not the same like you know rural Queensland with um, suburban or urban Melbourne like they're very different populations but you'd say like there's one country and the role of anyone who's elected is not to govern for who voted them to govern for the majority it's to govern for everyone like you're not elected just because you're elected by a few does not mean therefore you only your allegiance is to them not to everyone and I think if I look at then to your point of like what does this Gen Z do I think one is you do not it, things do not need to be sequential. You do not need to earn the right by having your own room in order before you can then act. Now, is it a very good set of behaviours? Of course. Like if you can understand and build something small and do it in a well way, then you can, you know, have a bit more um, belief that you could do it in a scalable or a structured way. But, you know, take um, Greta Thunberg, who everyone will have a view on because, it's, you know, it's been so popularised and so agnostic of my view on right or wrong you cannot deny the force of nature that she's created and unlocked in terms of into a political discussion. More recently in Australia, um, Brittany Higgins, Grace Payne, another great example of not conforming to historical norms. And to our point of in, um, you know, what would the world look back at in 500 years to now? I think one thing that for me, I'd like to have a very strong opinion on the matter <laughs> is that um, white men rule the world. I really hope that in 500 years from now, we'll look back at that and say, like, yeah, finally, like, we, we changed that sort of shift. Um, I saw a photo from the, in Munich, they've got the European military uh, conference uh, at the moment. And this is just a photo, and it's, like, just all white men sitting around the table deciding, you know, how do we secure and, like, are we going to go to war and all of this thing in Ukraine? And it was like, how is that representative actually of the population of like of humanity and it's not um so what does gen z do i think gen z has to the, the beauty of being young is you're um you're not constrained by as many um pieces of societal 
um, conformity or you haven't built as much armor. There's a, uh, in philosophy and um, psychology, sorry, not philosophy, in psychology, there's a whole piece around like the biggest constraint to your, to your, you being yourself is not fear. It is the armor with which you protect yourself from fear. So it's not the fear of being vulnerable that actually prevents you. It's that you, because you have that fear, you put armor up. You say, okay, well, then I won't go into these circumstances. I won't take that risk. I won't force my real opinion because then I would be attacked or then I might have it. So therefore, I put these barriers up. And I think that's the beauty of youth um, is that you just have less of those pieces of armor built into your mechanism. I've, I've spent certainly the last uh, decade really just trying to start um, taking off my armor. And I've got a long way to go. <laughs> but that, that's really what I think is one of the, you know, two point one Gen Z's. I think before that armor gets built on, you actually just shake, shake the cage a bit. So I'd say that's one piece. And then the second piece, which is more the strategy, you know, the ex McKinsey guy in me is, uh, I'd be very targeted. Like it's very easy to pick apart a few problems. And if you bring a uh, collective force to a, a pressure point, you can have a far greater impact. And so I'd really focus. And I think that's a, as a theme uh, where I, you know, I'd say I'm very hopeful. Like if you look at the number of youth groups, if you look at the, whether it's political or apolitical, but like the number of behaviors that are being driven by young, hungry voices, even if they're not in positions of power, I, I think it's like it's never been as good as it has. Um, so that would be the positive piece in me. Um, and I'd say it's going to come. <laughs> and so the question is not will it or won't it? And my point would be how do you do it in the best way? Well, not the best way that's wrong. It's not like how do you improve with every action the direction and the, and the approach? Absolutely. Absolutely. But change, change is not linear. Change does not happen by just mm. the big substantial changes have to have a real tussle. Yeah. And yeah. hopefully in those real tussles, that, that's when we see it. You know, I mean, take Australia's history. It's like we've got so far to go on so many dimensions. But if you look at the big momentous pieces, native title, um, in, uh, equality of vote, like, uh, female, like we were one of the first countries in the world in 1902 to give uh, women the vote. Like, but these things didn't happen just because, oh, you know, we're going to get there and uh, things trudge along. No, there are people and forces agitating for change and they create that deviation. So there's so much going on at the moment, sort of thing. You know, yeah, there's so much going on, obviously, in Australia and the world. That sort of change, you, you do see a lot of change happening and shift happening at the moment which has been good to see as you said earlier you do see that sort of coming through the system and the works now that's quite good yeah now i wanted to i mean we've foreshadowed it a bit here and there and all the topics that we've talked about here but i think this might be one of the last things that we talk about here and i think i, I think that's you know we've talked about the corporate role for some time but then we've also talked about entrepreneurship and we're talking to someone right now that has sat on the fence of both you know you've been in mckinsey and if, if if, if I'm not wrong, it was for nine, nine, nine years, if I'm not wrong. And you've also immersed yourself in the world of entrepreneurship, the world of startups. Now, as someone who's been in both of, of, the, of those two worlds, what would you say are the pros and cons of, of each? And is there any specific one that I think you would say you favour over the other? Yeah, the, the theme that I'm... Um that's very clear to me when you have a diverse set of experiences, which I've been lucky to have, is that you end up realising you're not as unique as you'd like to think you are. Now, that should not take your aspiration away um, or make you feel like we're all in the matrix. But what I mean very practically is um, you can simplify your individual self, your personality. So if you think of like your behaviours, your needs, your drivers, um, you can actually simplify that dramatically and see that there are types of work or types of problems or situations that you are very naturally uh, driven towards and work well. And then there are those who are very, uh, you know, like a chaos for you. 
And so the luxury I've had in like both being in a lot of startup environments, small groups, mentoring on the investment side, working in uh, Kinsey, big corporates, I thought, yeah, I've just been in lots of different situations that I've had experience where I can say like, oh, I love this, I hate that, love this, hate that, love this, hate that. And they were never as clear as like, again, it's like industry or not industry. It was much more for me based around problem. Um, how interesting is the problem to me? Could be not interesting to someone else, but how interesting is it to me? How I'm, how I'm, uh, like energized do I get from the people I'm tackling that problem with and how does it play to my better sense of like purpose or meaning or like a, a, my own evolution if you like and so the the practical thing I would say is my experience has been that you can be very practical coming out of university like there's a structure the world works this way 80% of the time you get this job they'll give you this opportunity you do that and whatever like do that but at least 20 percent of the time if not more focus much more on what drives you um and there's a great um very simple piece of writing on this have you heard of daniel pink book called drive it's very it's called drive it's by daniel pink and it's very simple he writes down that basically for put simply um for a long time in the 20th century we thought um you may you incentivize people by either a carrot or a stick. Like that's how people worked. Yeah. Either they got a reward, so they'd do it, or they got a penalty, so they'd do it, right? Or they wouldn't do it, you know, whichever way. And that's how they ran. Like Henry Ford ran his construction line for automobiles. It's like everyone is in this role, you drop out of line, you get whacked with a stick. If you do well, you, you know, you get paid your, your check. And that drove a lot of the thinking, a lot of the workforce evolution. And a lot of the science, um, it was sort of swept under the rug in um, 50s, 60s and so forth onwards without actually like it's not as simple as that. And one very powerful example that uh, he uses is if you take children or you take um, anyone really, but specifically young people who are not quite so contaminated and you give them a task that they enjoy doing. Like if you put up young kids, you put young kids on a table with paper and crayon, they'll draw and they'll just love it and they'll do it for hours. And they'll split these groups into two and they would pay one group. So if you draw, you get paid a dollar. So draw a dollar, draw a dollar, draw a dollar. And the other group, just the same. Just they're on the table, you get to play and do. And they studied them over time. So once a week, they'd come and do this. And over time, what happened? The people, who do you think enjoyed drawing more? You know, months down the line. I would argue the ones that weren't being paid because they're intrinsically motivated to actually keep going as opposed to having that stick. Yeah, and this is the point. Actually, not only is carrot and stick not the only driver, like they were not driving, they were drawing because they just enjoyed it and it was an expression and it was a, a meaningful expression. But using a carrot or a stick, in that case, using a carrot, corrupted that actual inner drive. Mm-hmm. And so his book is around drive, like what drives us, and he simplifies it into three pieces, which is um, autonomy, mastery, mm-hmm. and purpose. And so you can find drive, like take sports a great example. Like, why do you go out and play? It's like, cause actually, you know, the uh, mastery of like getting better at a skill, getting better, better, better. Like, actually, you don't need to even be rewarded for that. Um, okay. If you go professional, but different, but the majority don't autonomy, like, you know, you're independent to do things. Um, and purpose, like the sense of fulfillment and deeper meaning. So I'm, I'm going off in the tangent from your initial question. Like, how do I compare like both an entrepreneurship and the, uh, you know, corporate structural word but world but the point i'd say is um back to where we started the entire conversation around like i think life is a journey and a search for perspective and I, i've been lucky enough to get that from a number of different views but all it does is help me try and see myself a little bit better and get a little bit better at choosing what the next thing would be so yeah i i just got like one and i Sean said it was going to be the last question. But one of the questions I've got in place, like I don't think you'd really <laughs> regret too much about how you went about your life to get to where you are today and what you continue to do in a sense. But if you could rewrite any part of your book in any way possible, you know, your story, the way you went about things, is there anything you'd change? Is there anything that you would have done differently? Obviously, to have the same outcome or a greater outcome in a sense, but um, is there anything you would have done differently at all or...? You're pretty content. Yeah, a hell of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd be a lot better at football and cricket. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, look, it's um, 
I don't, I don't buy into like, I, I think everyone has regrets. Um, I don't think that they're like a negative, like it's a purely negative connotation of regret. I think, I think it's like, shit, I just, you know, if I had that time again, I wouldn't do it that way. Right. Um, or, oh my God, I can't believe it took me, you know, 10 years to realize that I needed to make a decision to change from this job or that career. And the reality is if you have your time again, um, you will undoubtedly do stuff differently. And what I try and then focus is, you know, I can't go rewrite, but I can certainly change what I do today and what I do tomorrow. And in that is I try and be driven by as much as I can this sort of inner questing, if you like, than an external perspective of what do I think it'll mean for other people? Because I, I think that's the biggest thing I change is I spent a lot of time and still do trying to shift from what do I think this will, you know, is this the right good job? Is this, does this make sense? What will people think of that? Even if it's not as overtly conscious, it's very yeah, unconscious yeah. in how I see myself. And so a lot of it is stripping that away. And there's, there's a great Steve Jobs um, quote around this, which is life, your life, you can only really tell the story. It only really makes sense uh, backwards. Like when you're in the moment, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And he uses an analogy of he went and studied, like he dropped out of university, but he stayed on campus and he just started going to calligraphy class because he loved the uh, precision of the design and the style and like this whole um, culture and application of like perfection in calligraphy. Yeah. And he's like, you know, at the time, I had no idea that that was useful and everyone told me it was completely unuseful. Uh, like it was a waste of time, but I just loved it. And then he would say like, actually, the reason I spent so much time and like, you know, I was bit of an asshole but like making sure the apple experience was so uh, meticulous was because actually of that love i had of calligraphy and i applied it here but you know like at the time i couldn't tell you that i did this and therefore that yeah. but in hindsight you can tell this great story about how things work together yeah, so i think that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ah, that's awesome Sorry. now to end everything off I'm looking at the time now, so we should probably wrap things things up. Now, to end off every yeah. interview, we yeah. essentially ended up with the exact same question. Go and for it. It's often, it's often you know, we've been told it's the hardest question that we ask because there are so many possible answers you could give. Now, what it is to end off this podcast is if you could leave young people just one piece of advice, what would that one piece of advice actually be? A year from now, you will wish you had started today. <laughs>